we have, uh, this one is presented by Creative Australia, and we've got Dan Golding and Brendan Keogh taking us through their report, Australian Music in Games Benchmark 2023. It's very official. It's the first comprehensive study into the scope and scale of Australia's game music sector, and reveals a diversity of working arrangements, career pathways, and skill sets among game music workers. Morning, everybody. Morning. Great. Thanks so much for coming along. Uh, we will start by introducing ourselves. Uh, Brendan, you're first on the left. Yeah, I stole first. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, my name's Brendan Keogh. I'm a researcher up at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. Um, robbed twice in the last 24 hours, one hour sleep, <laughs> one premiership. Um, but yeah, and I also make games on the side. Um, I made a little game called Brendan Keogh's Putting Challenge last year. Released it on the same day as Elden Ring. Sorry, from software. Um, but yeah, that's me. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm uh, not as funny as Brendan, uh, and <laughs> I uh, I work at Swinburne University, where I'm an associate professor there uh, in media. Uh, but I also make music for games, um, so I have a very special kind of interest in this whole project that we've done. Uh, and I've made music for games like Untitled Goose Game, uh, the Frog Detective series, and most recently uh, Mars First Logistics. Um, we also will be joined by Taylor Hardwick, uh, who worked on this project with us, was a really integral uh, part of it. Uh, she'll be joining us up on the stage uh, for the discussion point of things. Um, Taylor's just over there. I feel weird pointing her out now. Um, but Taylor, um, uh, I guess for the purposes of this project, was a QUT researcher, um, also uh, did her PhD via Swinburne, and is a newly minted member of the Free Play Board, which is exciting. Ask her for parallels tickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, basically, the uh, Australian Music and Games 2023 benchmark uh, was commissioned by Creative Australia, which you may know by the Australia Council for the Arts, their previous title. They've recently been renamed. Um, who, and basically, um, the purpose of this was to try and establish some pretty key questions, uh, and we think probably pretty key and important for uh, everyone here today, which is who is making music for games in Australia? Uh, where are they? Who is licensing music in Australia? Uh, and where are they? What types of music is needed by game developers? What is the barrier to increasing the amount of music used uh, and getting that music to be Australian? Um, what, if any, professional support does the sector need? And also suggestions for future data capture. So what we did as part of that... Yeah, yeah so that's what Creative Australia wanted, to learn all these many things. So the way we approached that, we went and did 20 in-depth, um, semi-structured is the formal term for you're allowed to go on tangents, um, interviews. We did 12 with what we're calling game music workers. Um, which is meant to cover composers, performers, all the other many roles you can have. Um, we obviously didn't just want to say composers or musicians, it's game music workers, it's complex, but it at least covers a wide range of things. Uh, we did four more with game developers at various scales of uh, company to kind of get a sense of what their needs and expectations are. And we did four with various industry organisations on both the music and games sides of things to get that kind of broader view. And then we also ran this quite large survey, which some of you may have filled out, and if you did, thank you very much for your time and insights. Um, and we got 90 responses to that. And so that survey was meant to capture uh, effectively anyone in Australia or who is Australian overseas who contributes music to digital games in any capacity. Um, and so the interviews were really, really valuable for providing that kind of in-depth personal story and context, and the survey gave us that much broader context of how many people did X kind of stuff which we'll be largely drawing from today. This one's me? Yeah, cool. Um, and I guess ultimately what we did was we wrote a massive report. Um, and you can access this report totally free on that QR code. We'll pull that up again at the end. Um, huge, it's like 25,000 words. It's like 75 pages. Has a heaps of the information we'll be sharing with you today and goes into way more depth than we will be able to. Um, and just really excited. It's just a big 
great body of work that I'm really proud of. Um, yeah, and we should point out as well, this is, I mean, this, this is the moment of the launch. This is really yes. the first time that, that this PDF has been seen by anybody that's not us or Creative Australia. Um, so um, we're really excited to, we are genuinely excited to be sharing this with you. Sometimes I think it can be academics up here launching research reports at various events and it can be just kind of a bit mundane and go with the flow kind of, you know, uh, everyday situation. But this actually, I think, we're really pleased with how this report turned out and we think that there will be a lot of really useful information to come out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so look, so what we wanted to do today pretty much is give you an overview of these findings. Um, there's a lot of findings, so we'll um, probably keep it fairly um, well, surface level for some of them and then we can dive into anything in co uh, discussion time at the end um, deeper if people want. Um, but we'll start with, I guess, with broad kind of observations we made, this idea of game developers, sorry, game music workers rather, as Venn diagram workers, and Dan will explain what we mean by that shortly. Um, and then we'll just go into, again, a lot of charts, a lot of graphs, um, which I'm sure you all love, about um, who, yeah, who are these people, how, how are they doing their work, under what kind of working conditions, what skills are they using, etc. And then we'll conclude with just some broad thinking about the future, the opportunities that seem to be emerging, and also the challenges that might be make those opportunities a bit difficult as well, I suppose. Cool. So the first thing that we wanted to start with is this observation, which I think really helped us frame how we understood game music workers uh, for the whole project. Um, and it's one of those things that I think kind of just immediately kind of makes sense, but it took us a while to really get there to, to, for this overall kind of framing as to how game music works. And that is that game music workers are what we're calling Venn diagram workers. There are other academic terms that would probably do this reasonably well, but we think Venn diagram workers, you kind of get the idea. Um, in other words, if you think of your classic Venn diagram, uh, game mus music workers fall in the middle of two circles. They are both part of the music sector and the game sector. They're reducible to neither, but they're part of both. And that they're formed by institutions, by regulations, by audiences, copyright and royalties, music distribution platforms in the music sector on the one hand, um, but they're also, you know, formed by game development norms and audiences and um, platforms, industry bodies, networks, um, all these sorts of things um, simultaneously, right? And so they sit at this in-between in point. And this also applies to, um, you know, broader ways of thinking about game music workers as kind of um, perhaps taking the culture of games to the regulations and copyright requirements of music, for example, right? And those sorts of things, not, maybe not necessarily um, uh, working that well together, or, or maybe they do, maybe they don't, but they kind of are brought from the combination of two sectors um, together. Um, and having to do a lot of translation work, which yes. you're getting at between those, that we spoke to a lot of uh, composers and, and game music workers more broadly who have to kind of educate the game developers they work with if how do rights even work or what is it even like to do this this kind of thing um, and vice versa having to educate kind of music organizations and the, the performers they're working with about how game development works so very much not just the kind of in both but the kind of the, the middle link of the chain between these two sectors as well yeah, absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, it also, the final point is is um, also their Venn diagram workers. We are Venn diagram workers in the sense of the way that we're brought into projects. We may not be the singular circle with that game development studio. We may be part of that kind of game development story. Maybe we're part of multiple circles as we work on multiple projects with multiple studios simultaneously. Um, so we, we are part of the game development circle, but not a one-to-one -one circle usually. Um, we did speak to some who were, but largely, um, largely not. And another way, um, actually, and I don't think we have this slide to, 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 to do that, that, but another way that we started to think about the different ways that game music workers work with game development studios is um, almost what, um, what channels in the game dev discord does the composer have access to? <laughs> and in some cases, it's just a single channel where it's like game music and you're talking with the game dev 
right, exclusively and you're locked out of everything else. And sometimes you have access to everything, right? And there's no particular set pattern. There's no one way this. to no do one it. Way. No, no. Yeah, there's a whole range of different ways that you can be part of this game development um, Venn diagram. Uh, we also came up with these four broad archetypes, and they are broad archetypes for um, types of game music workers in Australia. Um, the enthusiast, the freelancer, the established musician, and the studio worker. Uh, because of time, I don't think I'm going to go into too much detail about all of these. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail in the report, but Essentially, we have quite a lot of enthusiasts in Australia, people starting out their career, not really on top yet of things like rights and payment systems. Um, we have people who are, we have quite a lot of freelancers um, who are relatively established in making games music. Um, they work between a lot of different projects as essentially the musician brought onto those projects. Um, they do a lot of that kind of um, um, education work for game developers who might never have thought about music regulations um, or copyright or anything like that before. Um, they have a deep knowledge of music software, but they're also comfortable with game engines and middleware. The established musician is a little bit different, um, which we do have quite a few of still in Australia, um, which uh, uh, essentially um, relatively established in the music industry. Um, but have been brought into the games industry um, in one way or another or have brought themselves into the games industry as well. Um, I, think, oh, I think I've copied and pasted the dot points. So oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's my error on this slide. That was but, probably me. <laughs> I think I did this slide. Um, but uh, essentially, the established musician, ignore those points up there, the established <laughs> musician is, is, is someone who is working more within the music industry who's brought into games. Uh, essentially, and be because of this, they're often able to insist on um, perhaps revenue share or a better share of essentially the a better financial deal, sometimes a better deal when it comes to retaining rights um, because of that standing. Um, they generally don't work in middleware. Um, they might just be providing the, the audio files. And then finally, the studio worker, which we do not have very many of these in Australia, but they do exist as an archetype, where you're working within the, the studio itself, you're essentially much more part of the games industry than the music industry. If I was to do that Venn diagram, you'd be much more weighted towards the game side of things. Um, you are heavily involved in implementing audio in engine. Uh, you're paid a salary that changes the uh, question with rights uh, in particular. All right. Cool. So we'll get into, I guess, some of the details of the survey now, like drill down into this, like what brought us to those kind of broader observations. Um, so firstly, let's look at kind of demographically, um, what kind of people filled out our survey. Um, and we thought it would be interesting to kind of compare our respondents to, I guess, a few different research projects on other creative sectors in Australia. Um, so first slide, we've got um, gender distribution or makeup. Um, as you can see down the bottom, music and art sectors based on other reports, relatively 50-50. Um, and I should note for reports, we're working on their only kind of report, male, female. They don't report other genders, sadly. Um, I think it's something the game industry is often a bit far ahead, um, ahead of. And the fact that IGEA does do it for their game development reports is, is is great. Um, screen composers, as you can see, historically um, has had quite a, some um, some bad kind of um, gender um, in inclusion challenges. And and what we what I found fascinating, at least from the game music responses, is almost identical to the kind of historic recent historic figures of the game industry, which is about 80, 20, 75, 25. Whenever this kind of surveys are run at a national level, really anywhere, in, um, well at least in, in in Western game industries, and so. The very similar for our respondents as for game industry more broadly. And there's a few possible answers to this. Um, one is a lot of our respondents first entered game music because they love games. And obviously, people of all genders love games. But the game industry has had some historic um, privileging, shall we say, of, of some genders more than others in terms of who is made to feel most explicitly welcoming games at a young age. Um, so that has probably influenced this, as well as a, long, a, a big reliance on existing networks in a local industry, which the game industry also has a lot of issues there as well from gender. So that's probably informing that one. 
Um, in terms of age, it's quite young, and the game industry itself is also chronically quite young. A lot of people explain this away, oh, games are a young industry, but like the modern game industry has been around for about 40 years now, and you know, whenever these kind of surveys are run, you know, there's often a cliff at about 35 where people leave the game industry and try to go get more stable work. Um, and game, the game music workers who filled out our survey, also quite young, um, especially compared to the arts and music sector, which are much more evenly distributed. Um, but again, very, very similar to the games industry there. Um, and the final one of these graphs is kind of where are, are these game um, music workers? And probably not surprisingly, they're very much co-located with where the game industry is in Australia. So the red bar there is just the distribution of the Australian population. And as you can see, the game industry and game music workers very much overrepresented in Victoria, which probably isn't surprising to anyone. There's all sorts of things here, um, funding, uh, um, kind of a legacy of game support. They do this Games Week thing you might have heard of. Um, <laughs> Um, Queensland as well, which has been Australia's other kind of historic hub, in con less, less consistently than Melbourne, also quite well represented. And New South Wales, which has been very inconsistent with kind of local support for the games industry, including last week where they got rid of funding and I think they brought it back again since they got rid of it. It's like we're trying to write a report here, please just make your mind up. Um, <laughs> very much underrepresented. So, but what's interesting about this, and we'll get to it later, is it makes sense they would be co-located because that's where the game industry is. But really, actually, no, I'm going to put a pin in that and get to that later. But it is interesting. Yeah. But. Uh, all right. And so what do they do? What do game, workers, game music workers do? Um, so we asked what sort of music work do you typically undertake for games? Uh, the vast majority of respondents said that they write music. Uh, they also arrange their own music. They produce or sound engineer their own music. Pretty similar response rates. Uh, they perform uh, their own music sitting slightly less, but still more than half. Um, less than half say they implement their own music into the game engine or middleware, which we found very interesting, um, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, and much lower responses for I arrange others' music, I produce sound engineer others' music, I perform others' music, I implement others' music into the game engine or middleware, or I create and or implement non-music audio for games. Again, sitting around 50%, a very similar number to I implement my own music into the game engine or middleware. So perhaps those engine middleware skills um, slash uh, composing or creating non-music audio for games are um, kind of linked and we talk a little bit about that. But as you can see, the vast majority of people who are working as game music workers are writing and working with their own music uh, rather than music of others. Um, and of the uh, amount of music work undertaken for games, um, basically you can see here it still probably skews to the smaller amount. So this is of their, sorry, of their total amount of uh, work undertaken. Um, so music work un um, constitutes a small amount of a, total, a person's total amount of work, um, about 40%, uh, a lesser uh, number say about half, so 14% of people said game music uh, is about half of their work, 29% uh, say most, and only 10% say all. So I guess what this reinforces is actually what broader studies have shown of the music industry in Australia, which is that people undertake um, what what is called the portfolio career, which you might have heard of, uh, which is the idea where you do multiple jobs, essentially. You, you establish multiple portfolios to your career, and for game music workers, creating game music is one of those portfolios. It might also be, who knows, a whole bunch of other different things you might do on the side. Maybe you do programming, maybe you work in another music sector, who knows. Really don't know what to do about the 6% who said none. Yeah. Um, I think that might have been an interpretation of a, the word work um, thing, because. They were still valid responses. Anyway, um, that's, that's one of the things of survey methodologies. Um, if that was you, please tell me afterwards what you meant by that. Cool. So how do they do it? What kind of like work arrangements are they working under? Um, overwhelmingly contract or freelance work. Like um, overwhelmingly, they're not you know, salaried employers inside the studio. 
they're working on a contract and to the portfolio career kind of idea. They're working across multiple projects. Um, sometimes they own their own business to kind of um, rather than freelance as an individual, but pretty much the same arrangement. Um, when we break this down by kind of percentage of um, men and women that responded, and here I am, we are only using men and women because we, I think we got three or four uh, more gender diverse um, responses, not enough to kind of make big claims like this about. Um, but yeah, none of the women who responded said they worked in full or part-time employment, or rather only the men who responded um, said they work in full or part-time employment, implying inside a studio. And those ones then probably in a much larger studio that needs a full-time composer, which not many indies require, right? But yeah, overwhelmingly contract workers. And I think if we connect that to uh, the next slide, is overwhelmingly working at home um, in their own studio rather than going into the game studio office every day, sitting alongside the other developers. Um, and so, yeah, so we'll go to the next slide. Sorry, I'm just going to go through those ones quickly because I want to draw this back to what I mentioned before about the, the co location for games industry. V those last two slides make it unsurprising here that a lot of um, game music workers aren't necessarily in the same city where the game developers they're working for are located. This was a select all that apply answer, and we've got 60% working with people in the same city as themselves, which makes total sense, but about 40% at least sometimes working for game developers based overseas, nearly 30% fully remote, people in different states, etc. So you don't need to be in the same city as the game developer to be able to work for them, because um, you're working in your own office, your studio, sorry, um, you're on a contract arrangement, um, and yet there is that co-location for local industry, which I think more so suggests, this is a point I wanted to put a pin in earlier, that the local industry and the visibility of a local industry is important, both for musicians thinking, hey, maybe I could do game music, and for getting those kind of first ins into the broader game industry by kind of being able to go to a games week or something like that. But then once you're in, you don't necessarily, you're not re restricted to only the game developers in your own city for getting work after that, it seems. And oh, sorry, really quickly, the other point I really want to make on this, contract work, remote, but also developers and musicians, uh, game music workers alike, very much em um, emphasise that they felt like the game music workers were a central creative kind of component of their team, despite this kind of contract work, which was really interesting. Yep. Uh, all right, so what skills do they need? This, I think, is a very interesting slide. Um, so what software do you directly use? when doing music work for games, and this was a select all that apply, so um, obviously these percentages don't add up. Um, and, and the, the asterisk, well, sorry, the asterisk ones are ones people added in other for themselves. Yep, so that's right. Um, I feel like now I need to own up to the fact that yes, I, we forgot to put Pro Tools in the <laughs> default list. Um, <laughs> I'm really embarrassed about that, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it still nonetheless paints a really interesting picture um, that the number one bit of software that's used by game music workers is Unity, uh, followed by FMOD, and then we finally get to DAWs, music-specific um, uh, software like Ableton, Reaper, Logic. Uh, then we get Unreal and Wise um, below that. So really interesting mix of um, skills um, and software that's being used. But also, um, I really want to emphasize that 49% of respondents use neither a game engine nor game audio middleware, which I think, yeah, I was intrigued by this because I think, you know, there's the overwhelming narrative that to be a game music worker, you must know how to implement um, and perhaps some of these people do know how to implement, but they are not implementing. And w in the qualitative interviews that we did, we actually did find also that that was true, that yes, a great many number of people do implement. And certainly those, if we, uh, if we combine this with some other stats that we had, um, those who do full-time work, as a games audio person are most likely to be implementing and working even within engine. So I think there's definitely a story there to be told about what kind of skills you want if you want to be working in games audio full time. But if you're assembling a portfolio career, you're doing other things and game music is part of that but not the whole story, then actually implementing may not necessarily be 
uh, the be-all and end-all um, part of the story here. Certainly not what's happening in Australia at the moment. So implementation skills are valuable, but music production and composition skills are, perhaps unsurprisingly, more essential. And communication skills, particularly in our interviews with uh, game developers, um, communication skills were highly valued. So by that, I don't just mean the ability to speak you know, well with other people or write a good email. What I mean is um, the ability to almost like do this kind of creative translation, you know. Uh, we had one great interview, I think, where the composer talked about being required to understand what a game developer means when they say the music needs to be more purple. Um, and so this kind of creative intermediary work, that's actually highly, highly valuable work. Um, cool. Yeah. And this is the final of these kind of question segments. Um, and I guess probably one you're most, most interested in, perhaps. Um, let's talk about payment and licensing. I'm going to talk about the payment stuff, and then I'll throw it back to Dan for the licensing. Um, very hard to get, I guess, really kind of confident data on this. Um, people gave us a very wide range of answers when we asked how much money have you made from all sources in the last 12 months, as well as just from game music in the last 12 months. Very hard to ask about like rates and things like that, because actually, just throw to the next slide really quickly. Just there's a huge way, range of ways people charge from you know, per minute of music to milestones to just flat rate for the whole project to profit share. You know, there, there's no one way people are doing this. Um, and so that means you, it's very hard to say just what are your rates. It's like, well, it depends. There's a lot of questions. But if you go back a bit, um, just quickly, um, I think the one on your right here is probably the most important one is the income from game music alone. Um, just over half of all of our respondents reported any mu any income whatsoever from their game music, like over a dollar. So a lot of people doing kind of speculative, hobbyist, aspirational kind of work there who responded. 14% um, um, the Australian kind of annual minimum wage of 45,000 a year, hitting that on just their game music, and 11% hitting the median Australian wage of 65 grand. Um, and look, those numbers are maybe small and depressing, but as we've seen, the majority of game music workers aren't doing this full time. They're also getting money from other from other sources as well as the other kind of table shows. And I don't have the number of a slide I can look it up, but I think we found this was actually relatively positive compared to the broader music sector, how much a musician generally makes just from music, which is actually quite promising, I think. Um, yeah, and I think as well, like, uh, although if we forget about those percentages for just a moment, the actual average once you hit the minimum wage, yeah. so anyone who's earning above minimum wage from game music work in Australia is actually earning quite a lot of money compared to other sectors, other creative sectors, and particularly the broader music sector. This is, I think, actually a very positive mm. story. Yeah. You, you can go into licensing now if you want. Oh, cool. All right, so then we asked this question, which I think is actually the thing that so many of um, our interviewees both game music workers and developers really wanted to know more about and told us time and time and again that this is something that people need to know more about, uh, which is about things like this. When you create new music for games, how are the rights typically determined? Um, so let's forget about the don't create new music 12% for a moment. 31% um, are saying an, on a non-exclusive basis. So in other words, I create the music and I license it to a game developer on a non-exclusive basis. I can license that music to somebody else in the future. Perhaps there's a term length, perhaps there's a uh, medium specific um, uh, requirement, perhaps I can only license it to a filmmaker or something like that, but I can license it to somebody else. 40% license that on an exclusive basis, so you pay me to make music for the game and you get an exclusive license to use that music um, forever. Um, only 13% say that the rights are retained by a third party. Um, so that's most likely in Australia, based on our respondents, to be someone who's working full time in a studio. Um, so if you're an employee, then you know that can change the nature of any intellectual property that you create. But this is also really, really interesting for comparing games music to other soundtrack industries because it shows that the, um, the buyout model where a game development company purchases 
the rights to your music irrevocably and forever is actually very, very small in terms of the overall picture of Australian game music development, and that would not be the case when it comes to other soundtrack industries. So that's a huge advantage in our corner. And 4% kind of gave a variety of other answers. Uh, now, this is a really fun and interesting one as well. Does the music you create for games typically get released as a standalone soundtrack? 56% said yes. Um, there was 16% no response, 16% don't know. I, I don't know how you wouldn't know. <laughs> if you answered that, again, I'd, I genuinely <laughs> would love to know um, what's I going on there. there. Sorry? Oh, uh, it could be in development. Yeah, okay, no, that's a good answer, yeah. I haven't actually got to that point mm. yet. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Is it Ben? Yeah, yeah awesome, thank like you, Ben. I've been yep. freelancing for about two years and I'm still nowhere near release. Yeah, okay, so okay, interesting. It's just like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, cool. No, that's, that's, a, that's really yeah. great clarification, thank just you. Just for the live stream people, they're saying maybe they haven't released the game yet, so yep. they haven't decided yet. Yep, yep. great. Um, cool, and, but only 12% said no. Definitively no. This is actually shows that most Australian game music projects get released as a soundtrack, I think. And again, this is probably different to, you know, say if you're working under a buyout model to create music for an Australian TV show, um, you may struggle to get that music released as a soundtrack um, because you have to convince somebody else that it's worth their time to release. Um, so. Uh, that also then flows onto this other chart on this um, slide, which is who is responsible for releasing your music as a standalone soundtrack if it gets released. 74% of people say they are personally responsible. I mean, this is kind of almost partly what I mean by portfolio careers, is that, um, you know, you're not just writing the music, you're not just perhaps implementing it, you're also the music producer figuring out the track listing, uploading to whatever platform or distribution service you're using. Um, but only 13% say my game development client releases the soundtrack, 9% say the game's publisher, only 4%, which would be a really negligible number of the overall um, pictures, say they work with a record label, which is something we go into a little bit of detail in this the report um, to point out that, that there is very little record label or uh, music publisher, uh, not game publishing, but music publishing. Uh, there is very little of that kind of activity in the game sector, game music sector. Mm. Okay. Great. So uh, we'll try to wrap up this bit, I think, pretty quickly so we can go into discussion time and get questions and for bits you're more interested in. Um, but yeah, like, I guess like free broad um, opportunities and challenges, kind of two sides of a coin for each one. Um, firstly, local game industry is growing very rapidly. Um, you know, the latest game industry snapshot from IGEA, you know, it's like over 2,000 game developers now. Um, and I think most excitingly for game music workers, they're doing more, more and more of them are focusing on their original IP, more and more of them are focusing on console and PC rather than mobile, all effectively suggesting there's going to be more and more demand for high quality game music, right? Um, but at the same time, the challenge side of this coin, they don't need to work with Australian game music workers. As we've seen, you can work with a game, a game music worker who's anywhere. Um, and the, what helps there is, I guess, um, public funding, kind of often putting pressure on you have to use this money for like local spend. Um, but we definitely spoke to developers who are like, we, it, we just use a developer, uh, musician overseas that we know and like him a lot because it doesn't make a difference. So that's a challenge. Then I guess the next opportunity challenge, which is that that can go the other way as well, right? Um, local developers don't need to work with local game music workers. Local game music workers don't have to work with local developers. Um, but the challenge there is so many of them, based on um, our responses, seem to be very much reliant on those local networks in order to get that first foot in, into the, um, you know, into, into the work. So what can be done there to maybe get, you know, more of you folk to like GDC or, you know, some games come in Southeast Asia or level up in Malaysia or NZ GDC to kind of build those kind of global networks so you're not only relying on, on Melbourne Indies to get your work. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess as we've kind of already preluded, Australian game music workers retain generous rights and control of their music for now. Um, and so that basically we're creating original music um, and I would say broadly the picture that we got from uh, composers and developers is that they have extensive autonomy of the kinds of music they create. 
Um, they have lots of opportunities to exploit their own music, so soundtracks, um, sales, um, uh, streams, radio play, these sorts of things um, are all genuine current existing revenue streams. They're not necessarily massive, but they do exist for Australian game music workers. Um, uh, and uh, this may change, um, I, I guess, you know, potentially even with the publishing of this report, uh, <laughs> it's entirely possible that a canny publisher somewhere might look at what we've published and go on, that's great, I'm going to get a slice of that pie um, and potentially start changing the nature of the, the, the contracts uh, that we see. But at the moment, um, uh, we, we do see, I think, um, not just autonomy, but, but freedom and opportunity for game music composers to do to do what they want and need to, I think, with with their music. Um, but there are opportunities as well as these things change. Um, I, I definitely won't be stealing Cam's thunder, but the the uh, the, the the performance royalties um, st that stream that's now been coming in via APRA and Europe uh, and future things, I think, um, again, just opens up more revenue streams for Australian game music workers. So I think this is. Um, a really, really um, big positive to come out of this report, especially, as I said before, in contrast to other soundtrack industries where they might look enviously upon this situation. Yeah, um, yeah and look, that's mostly it, I guess, just in way of summarising, um, reading these points. Um, it's exciting, like the game industry's getting bigger here, there's more and more interest in, um, from the music side of things, of getting involved, so, um, it's a bit of a wild west in terms of how the licensing and work arrangements work, which on one hand is very stressful for a lot of game music workers. On the other hand, there's a lot of interesting innovation and experimentation in how that could work in a way that is in the game music worker's favor. Um, I think just stressing there's no one way of being a game music worker, I guess is one of the main things I guess we wanted to stress in this report. There's no, oh, I don't know how to use Unity. I must be a bad game music worker because everyone else does it. That's not necessarily the case as I think our data shows us. Um, many different way, many different places to sit in that Venn diagram overlap area, um, but yet nonetheless, there are these kind of entrenched structural inequalities, um, largely brought over from the game industry, it seems, but also from screen composition as well. Um, and these are going to require some pretty proactive solutions from funding policies, um, from developers, from organisations, etc. Um, but yeah, let's like leave it there and get some questions. Um, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll get our co-author up to also answer some questions. I love a positive look at the industry that's backed by data. <laughs> like, that's just extra lovely. All right, let's dive right in. Did you have any info on cultural backgrounds of music workers in Australia? Yeah, um, little, essentially. Uh, we only got to the survey, only one respondent. Um, self-identified themselves as either Indigenous or Torres Strait Islander. So we obviously couldn't go and say, um, you know, in, in the graphs kind of make extensive claims about Indigenous or Torres Strait Islander um, um, game music workers, um, though it seems very much like there's not that many involved in the space, which seems like a massive um, oversight or part of that broader structural issue, especially um, considering how many Indigenous Torres Strait Islander musicians there are. Um, for ethnicity, we um, and I would do this differently next time. We just had a text box where, like, write your ethnicity how, how you would want to write it because survey design is a minefield. Um, and it's in the report. I have a copy of it. I'll look. Um, it's low. I, I want to say of people who actually gave us response, seventy percent could be, could have been summarised as white, Caucasian, or, or Western um, in in that ballpark. So um, similar to gender, like very similar to the rest of the games industry. It seems. Did you get a lot of people like listing every type of white they are? We we got one Preston, um, so um, switch. Yeah, the problem for text box thing in hindsight. But, yeah. What was your own personal takeaway from undertaking this research? What surprised you? Um, I, I for me, I was just I was kind of um, gratified. I I think by the diversity of approaches to making games music I think that yeah like I've it's weird to say like because I've been involved in some fairly high profile projects but I've nonetheless internalized the fact that because I don't work in unity right 
or anything like that. I make the music and I work on the strategy for the music, um, but that that's okay, that it's not, you know, I, I just, it's, it's very validating to me actually. And I think that that shows that there is such a diversity of approaches and actually being good at music and being good at understanding how games work is great, um, you know, but it doesn't have to be kind of one way or the other to me. There's one, should be one on the chair, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I'm a professional. <laughs> That's all right, it was hidden. It was in the little crap. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe something that surprised me going in, I did a lot of the data analysis for the interview specifically, because um, I'm not good with spreadsheets. But um, pretty much everyone that you spoke to went into games, music, because they love games, um, and had fond memories of being a child and playing I don't know, Donkey Kong or whatever. Just being like, whoa, the sound is incredible, the music is incredible, and now, 30 years later, this is what I want to do. Which I thought was really cool. It wasn't for the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is true. Yeah, we did explicitly ask in the survey as well, and very few people ticked the, it's just another gig. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of, you know, making money as a professional here. Mostly was, I have a particular interest in game music. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. And I think, like, yeah, people, games are a very normal, um, cultural medium now, right? Like, they're older than probably a lot of the people in this room, frighteningly. Um, in terms of, like, the modern game industry, that kind of started in the late 80s, early 90s. So, like, it's for industry you grew up, or sorry, the industry, the medium you grew up with, so, of course, that's where you're going to want to do your music work as well. Um, I think what surprised me is, I think, yeah, just that it's not as precarious or as miserable as I was expecting it to be. Because um, I'm coming out from the game industry side, and a lot of my previous work is about Yes, the game industry makes billions and billions of dollars. That's not the experience of most people who actually make the games. That's Sony and Microsoft. Um, so I was coming into this thinking, oh, Creative Australia, I think it's just like pots of gold at the end of a game does a development rainbow and I'm gonna need to deliver the bad news that it's actually not like that. Um, and, and of course, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's precarious. Yes, it's very much portfolio work. Um, but the range of experimentation, the range of ways that game music workers are making it work was very fascinating and surprising. Well, I mean, the slide that you had about income probably shows that you should not be in this for the money. Yeah. It's or, a or, tricky one. Or maybe not just this, I guess, mm. more specifically. Um, but, like, it's just, like, I guess, music work more broadly, as I think Dan said, that um, you're very likely going to be doing a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of different things. Um, and, and the average game studio size in Australia is still less than 10 people. It's overwhelmingly indie. Yes, we're getting a new tax offset, but it's probably going to remain indie for quite some time. Indie developers don't need a full-time composer in, in the studio, so. Can I also add that people often express that rather than receiving a low dollar amount for the work they'd done and feeling underpaid that way, they more felt that they didn't know how to translate timelines or mm. kind of redoing work that maybe needed to be tweaked or something because it wasn't purple enough or whatever, um, and, and translating that to how much we get paid. Like the amount of labor seemed to make it feel like less rather than the actual mm. amount they received, did that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I think as well, one other thing that we haven't really talked about as part of this conversation is profit share, um, which was a relatively common uh, response as to how things were paid for, uh, how money was made. Um, and we certainly had a lot of composers that we spoke to sort of talking about profit share as not only potentially financially quite good, um, but, uh, you know, and risky, of course, as well, but that it kind of more meaningfully creatively integrated them into the project and that they felt like a member of the development team because they were invested in the success of the end product. Um, so that's another really interesting story that's, that's in the data and in the report. And speaking of money, there is a panel coming up after this one. Uh, at 11 that will be about game royalties because we all love getting paid. It's important for your job. Any specific ideas or suggestions on proactive solutions to increase diversity in the sector? Are there things we can be doing at the community level? I think Taylor wrote a PhD on this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just invest in community, hey. Just like <laughs> really be cool to each other. Um, I, I also think that it's just really important to um, invest in skills uh, for people who maybe are represented by that like 
white male big section um, to invest in the skill sharing with people who maybe don't look like them uh, and kind of looking down and behind rather than ahead, I guess. Yeah, and I think the variation in skills and backgrounds that people have, I think, speaks to, um, there are kind of more, I guess, like STEMI skills that are also seen as very masculinized as well, like programming and whatnot. And I think on one hand, yes, of course, women can code. Um, yes, of course, all these other things. But even in that kind of structural disadvantages, um, more diverse people have in those kind of more STEMI areas. Um, I think our research so you don't even need those skills to still be able to do game music with more mm -hmm. a traditional music training as well. And there is probably much more of a cultural um, concern as well. Um, I had another point I was going to say, but I Well, I was just going to jump in and say that this is where that Venn diagram framing actually becomes doubly important because the Venn diagram is not just about skills and sectors and, you know, norms and all these, and culture. It's also about diversity in that we're talking about game music workers being at the intersection of two male-dominated industries and two, you know, uh, pretty white <laughs> um, uh, uh, sectors and so in some respects we're talking about a doubly thorny problem because you're working within kind of decades of bias and structural inequality from two overlapping industries mm. and so the problems are uh, you know and I, I actually don't think that we have enough data in this report to specifically address um, specific suggestions for um, increasing, for solving that problem. Um, maybe that's that's a future project. But, um, but I, I do think that it's important to think about these problems as not just endemic to the games industry and not just endemic to the music industry, but to both. And that's where game music workers find themselves. Mm. It's, it's also an area where um, government funding bodies can make a huge impact by it being a selection criteria, essentially. Like the Australian game industry has loved, has, loved, have, has loved to complain for like a decade and a half about the lack of government support, despite having heaps of government support, um, about, oh, why doesn't, the industry, why doesn't the game, the government fund us like proper art sectors? And you're like, well, look at your gender disparity. Like, of course they're not going to fund you. Um, but what we're seeing with like the increase of kind of games committed funding is, you know, it kind of puts the onus on developers to, um, it can sound, I guess, maybe it risks tokenism, but also like we're not just going to fund a bunch of dudes. Um, so do something about that, like proactively actually figure that out before you come and ask us for money. Um, and I think the other point with the kind of a 20, 25-ish percent of the game industry, back in I think it was uh, two, the late 2000s, I remember um, us fighting with people on Twitter about it at the time. Um, <laughs> Doesn't was, sound like us. Um, it was like 8.7% non-male, um, the Australian games industry. So it's bad now, but it was a lot worse. So things are better, but not good. So, and I think there's the rise of indie, the rise of public funding, there's all sorts of cultural changes that are in the process of hopefully continuing further down that way. And if I can throw in my two cents as well, yes. I think it's important to remember that diversity, as in perspective, is absolutely a strength to any project the amount of times that I've had to say, hey, that font's racist, or anything like that, like that is perspective that is lived. And you need to have people who have different lived perspectives to be able to see that stuff. I think that's a really good point, Brad. And I think actually one other thing that we talk about in the report is the diversity of music styles in games music being actually a kind of strength. Mm -hmm. Because in film and TV, there's this, and there's, there's a great report that we looked at a lot um, about gender disparity in screen composing um, film and TV and illustrated by Catherine Strong from RMIT. And she talks about there being this perception that there's kind of music that women write. And, and so you might get a woman to do a soundtrack for a period drama, but not an not a, not a action blockbuster, because, you know, like there's this weird kind of assumption that, a, a, you know, a, a man, like, and you would never say this outright, it seems even strange saying it now, but the, this is the one of the many battles that is being fought in, in film and TV. And because games, especially the kinds of games that are made in Australia, really fall into those kinds of big action blockbuster, triple A mould, where there's a kind of expectation of the type of music you might have, I think that that is perhaps an advantage in, in genuinely, you know, um, changing who works on games and, and 
throwing out those horrible ideas. <laughs> when, okay, something that's actually useful. Like when I say like investing community, um, kind of if someone offers you work uh, and they are looking for, for example, a cultural aesthetic that you don't have the lived experience with, um, saying no, even though that might hurt your portfolio development or maybe you really need that money, like saying no and saying like, hey, I actually know someone who is from that culture and reaching out to them is something that you can just do that would make things better, even if it doesn't feel good in the short term. For your wallet, I mean, like, <laughs> specifically. I was gonna make a joke that I probably shouldn't. All right, is there research about game workers globally or outside Australia that you can compare slash contrast to your findings about the Australian industry? I think there's, we think we found one survey in yeah, the US. Yeah, there's an American report that's done, but it's the, the kind of standard of um, data, it's, it's just a little bit different. Um, so there, there is an American study that's done. Um, it's also um, submitted to by a lot of um, international people. Um, so it's harder to just get a benchmark for like comparing America to Australia, for example. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I, I, I mean, look, I think actually, you know, it just highlights the fact that this, is, this was such a, um, such a great project to be commissioned by Creative Australia to have the foresight to know that this, this work needed to be done um, because there isn't that many international comparisons. Yeah, and this kind of links back to the what surprised you question. I never would have thought to actually go and think of like game music as its own dedicated space worth studying, not worth studying, but that should be studied as as, as its own thing. Um, and I think this project has shown that it is. And so I guess hopefully other countries follow suit and do their own benchmarks as well. So I was largely just going to say what Dan already just said. but. Ooh, spicy question. How prominent is the use of AI-generated music in the games industry now and in the near future? Will this become a big obstacle for game composers? Brendan's opening his iPad because we did ask about this and I'm sure he's bringing up the actual statistic. <laughs> yeah, we, um, towards the end, we were nearly done designing for survey and we're like, God, we need to add AI questions, don't we? <laughs> um, Dan like sighed, I was like, yeah, we do. Um, where is it? Right at the end. Um, it's, <laughs> that's why it's the last thing we talk about. Um, look, people were more, sorry, I guess firstly to directly answer the question, we don't know, well, from just this report, how widely used um, AI software or technology is. Um, but in terms of how I think game music workers feel about it, there's much more anxiety than excitement about it. Um, we had two kind of strong agree, strong disagree, pick on this kind of box of five questions about AI, 18% um, either somewhat or strongly agreed with a statement, AI technology will make my work easier in the coming years, 47% are worried that their work is at risk of being made redundant by AI technology. So definitely much more concern about how will developers use this to not have to pay us at all than there is how can I do exciting things with this concern at the moment? And I will just also add that there is another uh, Creative Australia Commission project yes. um, from Sam Whiting at the University of South Australia, um, who's looking into the question of AI and game music in Australia. So there'll be much more substantive answers to that soon. And I think wants to speak to people who yeah. are using it. So reach out to us and we can put you in touch if you are. And last question, any advice for the enthusiast archetype to get involved with their first project? Yeah, so ways into the game music industry is a question that we asked a lot of people um, and the answer uh, is a really difficult one that does not help answer that question at all, <laughs> which is that the vast majority of people we spoke to told us a story that went something like, I was at a party or on Twitter and I got chatting to someone and eventually they said they needed music for their game and I said, I think I can do that. <laughs> and that's how they became game music workers. <laughs> <laughs> and so I... <laughs> that's not useful, is it? I, can't, I mean, I can, it is, yeah. because it's saying good thing you're at high school yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> that's true, that's true. Yeah, that is, that is true. Um, so networking, and we do talk about the importance of, of events exactly like this, um, mm. but it is, it's... It's difficult to replicate. Yeah. yeah. And from the developer side, stressing we only spoke to four to kind of just get different, you know, scales kind of represented. Um, 
they're getting so many emails from composers being like, hey, can I do the music for you? Often, um, and sometimes that seems to work, but very rarely, um, and often a bit of frustration, they're like, hey, I saw your trailer, do you need music? And they're like, there was music in the trailer, dude. Like, <laughs> we're, we're, we're clearly fine with that, and it's gonna be years before we do another project, and we're probably gonna use the same musician at that point. Um, so, what else was there? So, I'm trying to remember I had another point. So for the developers, the cold calling doesn't always work. It's the previous relationship, it's knowing that they can do music of a similar taste and style as what they're after. Um, some game industry experience, again, not necessarily in Unity or, or middleware, but in terms of knows for kind of how to work as part of an indie team with kind of a, um, being part of all the Discord channels if necessary and whatnot. So ha having done that kind of stuff before, um, and that's obviously frustrating advice as well, which is why so many game musicians start with, you know, game jams and really small things just so they have something of their portfolio. But I felt like that was gonna be much more concrete advice than it turned out to be, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Vibe in the room, would you all want a session like next year or something about how to network? Is that a thing that people would be into? Cam, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I have no say in this, I'm just throwing out ideas. Um, all right, well that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing work yeah. with us. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. <laughs>